Welcome, everybody. This is a U.S. Grace Force podcast. I'm Doug Barry, along with my very good friend, Father Richard Heilman. And tonight we have with us Father Chris Alar, once again joining us. And of course, we always like to bring you really interesting topics and really exciting titles like this one, Has God Shown Us How to Avoid Chastisement? Although we're very serious about this. And considering the sensitivity of the times that we're in, it is definitely a subject that needs to be taken seriously. So we do mean... Yes, we want to keep things a little bit light now and then, but we've also got to really dig into the, the nuts and bolts of this sort of issue so we can really respond the right way and actually try to avoid, you know, the uh, the chastisement that's been uh, talked about and that's been worn through so many uh, messages. Before we get into all this, of course, we do want to start with a prayer. Father Heilman, we turn that over to you. Sure. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Father. And we want to thank all of you out there who support the U.S. Grace Force podcast. Every episode, I just can't thank you enough. Your comments, your prayers your encouragement, every way that you help us means so much to us. For those of you who support us through the Patreon program, also that is a powerful way to help us, and we thank you so much for that. If you're interested in helping to support this mission and help us get these messages out to as many lives as possible, with the time that we have, click the link in the description below for Patreon. A few dollars from a lot of people goes a long way and helps us reach a lot of lives, a lot of souls, and I mean that. So please consider doing that. And we thank all of you for that. You are in all of our prayers. And also don't forget the U.S. Grace Force gear page. It is the official gear page. Some great t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, all types of items out there. Get great messages out there. Uh, we have Gracie, of course, the mascot of the U.S. Grace Force. So go check that out. And that's another great way to help support the work that we're trying to do here. Uh, also, again, I mentioned this last week when I mentioned it this week. Don't forget to check out a great new family-based YouTube channel called Always a Kid. Link in the description below. Remember that innocence that God is calling us all to, no matter what our age is. So check out Always a Kid. It's a fantastic YouTube channel to bring a lot of joy and hope and a lot of, a lot of again, innocence in the world that we really, really need to be experiencing. Father Heilman, we have with us again, good friend returning from the bullpen, I like to say, yes. Father Chris Alar. Father Chris, good to have you on board tonight. Thank yeah. you. Always great to be here with you guys. Yeah, and you were just talking about joy and hope, and that would be two perfect words I would use to describe <laughs> you, Father. But uh, it, it, you're uh, the provincial head of the Mar Marians of the Maca Conception. and uh, But you're, I know for Doug, too, and for all of our listeners, you're one of the most trusted sources out there for teaching yeah. and and just becoming spiritually strong and everything that you right. do. We're so very grateful for that. And we asked you to be on tonight. This act, this is actually airing on the feast day of St. John Bosco. So we're going to get into that uh, a little later. You might notice too behind me, I actually have the two uh, columns or pillars of St. John Bosco. That's actually Our Lady Help of Christians. And then I have a monstrance on that side to indicate the Eucharist, which is what he had in his dream. But again, we'll get into that later. But Father, we wanted to start out too, because um, you wanted to uh, point to something that our Holy Father uh, had said this past Friday, and just to uh, add a little bit more clarity. But if you could go ahead and just share what you, what uh, our Holy Father said on Friday. Yes, and I think it was very timely and very important due to the confusion that ensued after the release of the doctrine uh, or the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, uh, their um, fiducia suplans, which uh, gave the indication to some that this was an endorsement for the blessing of homosexuality um, or, in essence, the, the union between those um, engaged in same-sex relationships. And actually, it, it did not, and we Marian Fathers issued a statement that we reiterated that we are to bless the sinner. If you read in the documents of the church, it's very clear that all sinners, and get this, even non-Catholics may be blessed. Um, all sinners, even non-Catholics may be blessed because what a blessing does is, is it dis, uh, properly disposes you to receive the grace of the sacraments. So we all are sinners and we all need blessings. 
But we Marian fathers, I released a statement that went a step farther and said that, however, we are not to bless the sin or the sinful union or relationship. And while were we attacked, we were attacked um, uh, saying that you're not being obedient to the church, which is telling you you must bless the sinful or the, the relationship. And the answer we stuck to was no. And uh, the confusion came from the word of the use couples. And did you hear what Pope Francis said this, fri this past Friday? He right. made it very clear in speaking to the cardinals of the dicastery. He stated twice, we do not bless the union. And so this confirmed everything the Marian fathers had taught, which we took much heat for. And he also said, you bless the sinner. You do not have to have moral perfection to receive the blessing, which is what we said. Bless the sinner, but not the sin, nor the sinful union. Still, though, he still didn't let go of the word couples because he said, if two people approach you and ask for a blessing, you are blessing the persons. So I still say that we still have some confusion because of the word couples, but he made it very clear we are not blessing the mm. union. And so we are very grateful uh, that the Holy Father clarified this because it just ratified our statement, mine personally, to my Marian priests that accidentally went public uh, and took a lot of heat, but it was very clear we bless the sinner, but not the relationship, not the sin, not the act of homosexuality. Father, do you think this is going to put this to rest? Because there's still going to be a lot of debate and a lot of discussion out there. Um, it was it was it was written initially in a way that even for me as a layperson, uh, it confusing. And the track record, of course, and this is not to criticize or condemn anything regarding the Vatican or the Pope. I'm not doing that. But the track record has been confusing. Do you think this is really going to help that? Absolutely. We have stated that it is confusing. We also got attacked for that. Uh, you know, Father, this is very clear what they're trying to do. Well, the fact is, I do admit, why couldn't that one sentence been put in there? We do mm. not bless the union. Mm. And 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 if that one sentence would have been put into the document, I think we we wouldn't have had such a, such confusion. So you are absolutely right. Confusion reigns supreme, and we Marian fathers tried to do a couple talks on this. We did a couple of videos that tried to explain it. Uh, but no, in no way, shape, or form are we as a church to condone the act. Uh, that is contrary to the will of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do not do that. We will never do that. And um, and this is just, again, clarifying what the statement that came from us, Marian fathers, that my priests here are not allowed to bless a same-sex union because mm -hmm. that entails the blessing or confuses people that it's condoning the, the act of same-sexual relations, which we cannot do. All right. Right. So, Father, you know, uh, I think almost all of our latest podcasts, we, we've been pointing to what's going on, especially in recent years. Uh, and I, I and I point to the dots I connected to was, you know, the uh, October 2019, that uh, that's when Our Lady of Akita gave a message to Sister Agnes Sisigawa, uh put on ashes and pray a repentant rosary every day. And uh, that was something that um, that we wondered what the message was for at the time. We didn't know what was going on. But I, I wanted to point to something too, because again, I've got the two columns of St. John Bosco behind us. Uh, I was looking back on an event that that took place here in uh, in the state capital of uh, Wisconsin, Matt. This was on January 31st. So by that time, we had heard that this message came from Sister Agnes Sisigawa, but we still didn't know why. But we had a sense that something was coming or something was about to happen. And so we got together, uh, actually with my friend uh, Dan Miller, of uh, he's the uh, head of Pro-Life Wisconsin. And then we worked at, we started in the middle of uh, January and worked at getting as many as could to come out. And it was kind of a cold and uh, snowy winter night that we decided we were going to take uh, the Eucharist and process it around the state capitol 
And also, uh, we took a statue of um, Our Lady. And so we, there we were with the two pillars on the Feast of St. John Bosco. So this would have been four years ago today, as, as people are watching this. And uh, that was the beginning of 2020. And we came to find out later that that was the very day, people can Google this, January 31st, 2020, that President Trump announced that there would be a travel ban from China and for, for some kind of virus. And people were like, that was the moment where people went, wait, what? I mean, it's that serious? What's going on here? Mm -hmm. and, and we happened to be processing the two pillars on that very same day. And there's just been uh, other things that have, have occurred since that time that I, personally I take as signs from God that um, you know we're, we want to avoid the ch a chastisement from God. And we ask God, what do you want us to do? And I just think that he has been sending signs and our lady as well. Um, you know, pray a repentant rosary every day. Uh, but put on ashes just, it just means, listen, it's time to repent, right? It's time for us to, to repent and, 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 and call out to God and, and to do it in all humility. Uh, you know, when I hear put on ashes, I think of course, of course, the story of, uh, Jonah and Nineveh. And, uh, you know, what, that's what they did. You know, they, the, the leader of Net Nineveh, you know, sat in ashes as the story's told. But anyways, father, um, here we are. And I, I'm of the school of thought that at the end of the hundred years of Satan, that <clears throat> like the battle of Lepanto, um, the Turks at that point in 1571 said, okay, they're weak enough. It's time for us to roll in and take over. That's, that's where I'm at right now. As I look at what's going on. So, we're suffering or we're going through this battle where evil is just, like I say, erupted all around us. And, uh, and I think um, we're, we are weak. And uh, can you help us understand, too, why does God allow chastisements or, or, or these, <clears throat> these difficult times? Um, if you could go ahead with that. Well, we know that the fact of the chastisements is prophetic, not only in scripture, but in the Mirian ap approved apparitions. You mentioned the Kida. Um, if you look at the conditions that are spoken about uh, by Our Lady, look at the biggest approved apparitions, all of them. Um, you have Cabejo, you have Akita, you have Fatima, you have La Salette. These are all the approved apparitions where Our Lady warned of chastisement. Now, what is interesting about that, though, is what the church teaches about prophecy. Prophecy is not predicting the future set in stone, and there's nothing you can do about it. And we come graveling to a crystal ball and say, okay, tell me what when the world's going to end, and tell me what's going to happen, and I want to know. No, prophecy is teaching, and what prophecy does is it, and it's not set in stone, it is conditional. Notice the one word that Our Lady began every sentence when she regarded chastisement at Cabejo, Akita, Fatima, La Salette, and others. Do you remember, Father, what's that one word she started every sentence? If. If, <laughs> exactly. She stopped every sentence with the word if. If you do not stop offending our Lord, if you do not, uh, you know, begin to turn back to him, if you do not uh, pray the rosary, if we do not uh, pray uh, for God's mercy, then these things will happen. But she emphasized the word if. This is conditional we have an opportunity. God gives us a way to avoid these chastisements if we will simply listen. Well, no, Father, that's not true. Chastisements in the Bible. Yes, this is true. There are five signs in the Bible of the end times. And to refresh our biblical scholars out there, do you remember the five signs the Bible gives that will happen before the end of the world. First is the gospel will be spread to all corners of the earth. And since COVID, shows like yours and our work at the Marian Fathers, 
we're, we're getting letters from everywhere around the world. I've been keeping track. And we've gotten letters from almost every country now in the world. The only ones we haven't are North Korea. <laughs> and I think that's because the poor people there could lose their life if they did send us a letter. Yeah. Um, and, and a couple other obscure countries. But the fact is the gospel, uh, God will bring a greater good out of things like COVID, your show, Grace Force, uh, us Marian fathers, many others out there that are helping to get the gospel out there is happening and, and has happened. So that's one. Um, and number two is the great apostasy. There will be a great falling away from the faith, uh, a disbelief. What's happening today? My goodness. Um, everybody seems to uh, have in one way or another uh, disbelief or there's just atheism run rampant. It, it really is an, a time of apostasy uh, that's very dangerous. Um, the third is the conversion of the Jews. Now, that can happen instantly. I mean, the second that Christ appears or however he reveals himself, uh, the Jews yet technically have not all converted yet, but the universal, universal conversion of the Jews can happen instantly. Uh, and then fourth is the coming of the Antichrist. We know that this is scriptural. Um, I did a whole talk on that a couple Saturdays ago. You can find it on our YouTube channel, uh, Divine Mercy. And then last, the tribulation. Mm -hmm. This is the chastisement. It'll be both natural and man-made. And there'll be conflagration, which is fire. You know, Father, I always laugh. Uh, I shouldn't laugh because it's not a laughing matter. But, you know, our Lord uh, promised that he would no longer destroy the world again by water. There would no longer be a great flood. But if you read the, the scriptures, it's going to happen by fire. So it's like, okay, Lord, yeah. you don't, you're not going to drown us, but now we're going to burn because we don't follow you. We, mm -hmm. we don't, we're not listening to you. However, again, that Our Lady tells us how we respond is what's critical. Since this is conditional, Our Lady told us, again, at places like Fatima, that if we pray, if we do penance, if we do the rosary daily, we can avoid these things from happening. And so why aren't we listening? Uh, boy, if there was ever a message to listen to in our lives, it's this one. And so let us keep shouting from the rooftops. You guys keep up the great work. Uh, you know, both of you guys, Doug and Father Heilman, to make sure that we get this message out there. Yep. Yeah, I'm curious, Father, you know, you, of course, had this amazing event that took place in October just last year. And it happened on the 13th of October, which is such a key date, has been for Fatima, the miracle of the sun. And of course, Akita, it was the final apparition of Akita in 1973. Since that happened for you in October, there's been a, a bit of fallout, uh, not fallout, but I mean reaction, let's put put in those terms. What has what has been your take since that all took place? What, yeah, what, there, yeah there's there's still question about it. Um, I, I fully understand the uh, the possibility of a reflection and whatnot. Okay, I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but for me, you know, the the I, I went through your show on the last time, the angles, um, the fact that people saw the same position no matter where they were seated. I just find that very difficult to believe that there wasn't something supernatural there. I find that personally hard to believe. I'm allowed to hold that belief. Uh, I'm not preaching or teaching that it absolutely was an approved church apparition approved by the Vatican. Um, I'm not teaching that. But I'm allowed to hold this opinion because I, you know, I believe it did not match. There was a statue of Our Lady uh, in the back of the church. But if you look at the optics of it, she was so far back that in the monstrance, if it was a reflection, it would have been about this big. But instead, it filled the entire monstrance. But again, that's OK. I, 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 I accept that. The fact is, what fruit um, are we getting from the Marian apparitions? And for me, the fruit is the Blessed Mother uh, along with the Eucharist. That is what's behind Father Heilman, the Blessed Mother and the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. These are the pillars of St. John Bosco. Uh, Our Lady, the help of Christians, uh, he saw as one pillar, and on the other pillar was the Eucharist. Now, here's what's interesting. We Marian fathers, more than any other religious community 
in the world that I'm aware of, and this is why I'm a Marian, um, point to two spiritual weapons. And uh, so, Doug, you just mentioned uh, <clears throat> the the battles that we've had to fight uh, to preserve Christianity, Lepanto, and and others um, that that we you know, we have to fight to be able to preserve our way of life. It doesn't necessarily mean you pick up a gun and shoot people, but but the spiritual weapons of our times are Mary and divine mercy. And how is God's divine mercy given us? The Eucharist. And so these two pillars are our spiritual weapons, Mary and divine mercy, the Eucharist. Uh, it's God's sign of mercy, the Eucharist. And so what a great day, John Bosco, to, to recognize what he's showing us in these two spiritual weapons. Yeah. You know, Father, uh, yeah, uh, Saturday morning, uh, this past Saturday morning, I got to speak to, uh, it was a Men of Christ Leadership Conference, and uh, there was 100, 150 guys there, at just tip of the spear kind of guys. It was amazing. And I felt like a Baptist preacher because I was so on fire with what I was <laughs> telling the guys. But one of the things I alluded to was um, something that happened in my last parish that I was at that right after I got there, it was a Friday after Ash Wednesday, I drive down the street and the the local tavern of mom and pop place, you know, that was very popular. All of a sudden, it's a strip club. I mean, mm. literally a stone's throw from this amazing 1888 church in this beautiful burg. And uh, and I, I, I went to sleep that night or I was in bed last night as a kind of praying as I'm dozing, but... I said, God, what, what did you have in mind? You know, I'm here. I'm just fresh, a pastor, and there's a strip club across the street. And, and making a long story short here, and a lot of people have heard this already, but we discerned that we should pray that strip club away. And we actually prayed the Stations of the Cross and Rosaries up and down the streets. And we began um, Palm Sunday that year, and we, we, we prayed every day. I actually went up to Blue Mountain State Park, which is behind – this beautiful berg and uh, on this these glorious hills with a lookout tower. And I actually took a, a branch of a tree and like a staff of Moses and I held it up in the air, you know, because Moses coming up against the Amalekites, right? And uh, every time he raised it, but we were doing everything, but, but, but we were not going to accept this. And seven months later, I'm going to make a long story short, the strip club closed and mm -hmm. praise God. And it was, a, but, if if that strip club remained, this would have been this uh, where I was. That would have turned into a, a prostitute. The the whole neighborhood would have turned into prostitution houses and drug houses. And I mean, it, it just would have been uh, hell on earth uh, if we accepted it. And then I turned to the guys when I gave the talk on Saturday morning. I said, "Listen, it's a metaphor. Okay, now we need to ask. Uh, so we we did something." And we did what God asked us to do. We used the calm weapons or whatever, but the power of God, we called upon the power of God and we stood and we united together, hundreds of people united together. And, and I said, uh, if we didn't, then that would have happened. But I said, this is a metaphor. I said, guys, what are the proverbial strip clubs that are opening across the street from you? alluding to everything that's gone on, especially in the last four years. Uh, that And are we just going to fold our arms and go, oh, I guess there's nothing we can do. That's a new normal, as they like to say. And what are you going to do? And, and it, it was my call to these guys to say, you know, there is something we can do. And I'm going to close with this too, Father, is that um, somebody was offering a reflection and they said, you know, let's recall again Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, the, that the comets hit, comets, Doug, I worked it in. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so the comets hit, all right, and two cities were wiped out. But were they all Sodomites? Were they all, you know, engaging in this 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 thing that offended God? No. So why were, that's that doesn't seem right. That why were the rest uh, annihilated? Well, here's why. They were indifferent to it. They folded their arms and said, what are you going to do? And they accepted it as a new normal. And that's why God. So how do we avoid chastisement? First of all, we don't engage in the sin. 
But second of all, we don't sit by and let the proverbial strip clubs open up across the street from our heart, from God. What do you, Father, right? I mean, we got we to gotta unite. We got to do something. We got to act. Right, Father? Yes. And in fact, Father, it's good you brought that up because we have to start with ourselves and then take it to the streets. So how do we start with ourselves? In fact, <clears throat> I've given a couple talks on this topic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention three things that to answer this question that is on the screen, has God shown us a way to avoid chastisement? And the answer is absolutely. Now, what are those three ways? Those three ways are very simple, yet so few people are doing it. I'll be honest with you, Father, I have held to this, this belief from the very beginning. I believe one of the biggest reasons the world is in the mess that it is in today, we're not baptizing our children. We are not. I am shocked. I talk to pastors all over the country. They tell me that they used to have hundreds of baptisms at their large parishes a year. One uh, had something like 180 baptisms, uh, you know, just a decade ago and had like six last year. Uh, it just unbelievable how we've lost that. that. I mean, what happens at baptism? You're given the grace. You're given the grace. You wash away original sin. You're given the grace of the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And and you're given that 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 grace to be able to, to withstand sin. It's so important. So that's number one. Number two is first Fridays and first Saturdays. This comes directly to the children of Fatima. She told Lucy this a little bit later in Spain. But to be able to do the first Fridays and first Saturdays, because what does it include? The Eucharist and the Rosary. That's part of the first Saturday devotion. And so, and first Fridays is the Sacred Heart. First Saturdays is the Immaculate Heart. This devotion is critical. So important. We've been doing it live on Saturdays for four years now. And um, this is critical to be able to answer Our Lady's call at Fatima. And this is... Uh, way she said to do it. Our Lady said, if if we don't turn back to God and if we don't stop offending him, these are the things that are going to happen, the wars and the chastisements. And the way she gave us to avoid that is the first Fridays, first Saturdays. And what is that? The Eucharist and the Rosary. Again, Jesus, divine mercy. The pillars of Bosco, uh, Mary, the help of Christians, and, and the Eucharist. It's unbelievable how this fit together on the day that you 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 are broadcasting on Saint John Bosco. Right. And then the third way, stay in a state of grace. Right. Be a grace force. <laughs> it's uh, this is the 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 only way. And if you say, well, Father, I'm struggling with pornography or I'm struggling with addiction, I'm struggling with drugs, okay, get to confession. All right. People say, Father, I don't go to confession, I sound like a broken record. You know what? I've, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the confessor for a couple of people that are struggling with sin, almost a particular sin, almost daily. And what I tell them, I don't care if you have to come to me to confession every day. As long as you're not presumptuous of God's mercy, and then you let that be the reason you commit the sin, because I can just come to confession. No, that's presumption. But if you are honestly struggling and you are honestly fighting, then get to confession. Stay in a state of grace. So has God shown us how to avoid chastisement? Absolutely. One, get baptized. Two, do the first Fridays, first Saturdays, which includes Mary, the Rosary, and the Eucharist. Um, and then third, stay in a state of grace. When we do these three things, this is all Our Lady says that we can avoid chastisement. So Father, to answer your question, start at a personal level, look in the mirror, first get yourself on track, then go preach the word, then get out there. Get out there and don't be complicit. Don't just sit like you said and become indifferent. What did Jesus tell St. Faustina that, that absolutely caused him more pain than anything else? The lukewarm sinner. He said, I'd rather you hot or I'd rather you cold. Just don't be lukewarm because that's what those people were at Sodom and Gomorrah that you talked about. They weren't maybe necessarily engaged deep in sin, 
They were indifferent. They were lukewarm. So to, to avoid that, get yourself back on track, baptism, first Friday, first Saturday, and be in a state of grace, and then go out and live the gospel just by the way you, you love, the way you act, the way you carry yourself. Let them know you're a disciple of Christ. They see Christ in you. Their world changes. And man, we can avoid these chastisements. Hmm. Father, can you break down um, a little bit about the Don Bosco dream in particular, that uh, about the two columns, the two pillars? This is something that you know many have looked at to see, are we living in these times? Is this the, is this the prophecy that he received? Um, and it's interesting, um, Father Hobman, you said your, your last church, did I get right? It was built in 1888? Correct. Yeah, because that's... that's that's near Don Bosco died. Right. Yeah. 1815 yeah. to 1888. That's correct. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny. I had to tell a quick little story. Um, you know, he saw, he always had his dog with him. Mm. And um, he believed that in a way that was his guardian angel uh, manifested was in this dog. And he always took his dog everywhere. And I had to tell a real quick story because my sister, whose birthday is on January 31st, St. John Bosco's uh, feast day. Um, she had a, uh, I'm sorry for the language, but a knucklehead husband. <laughs> and he abandoned her mm. after 24 years of marriage for a mm. girlfriend, um, abandoned her and two kids and uh, crushed her self-confidence, crushed everything. She had no, she had no faith or belief anymore, no trust in anyone. And my father got her a big yellow lab from somebody at work who uh, could not uh, longer keep the dog. He was her protector. He took on the coyotes that would, would come around. You know, the, you gotta be afraid of these things because they can be aggressive. He took on the, a pack of coyotes. This dog was awesome. <laughs> and this dog brought my sister back in many ways to just being able to be civil again. And his name was Bosco. Oh, nice. <laughs> that was the name of the dog. So I laugh because nice. John Bosco uh, had that special dog. My sister had the special dog. Her feast day or uh, her birthday is January 31st, St. John Bosco's 31st. And the dog's name was Bosco before she even nice. got him. And uh, so what was it in the dream? We He saw the ship that was uh, fighting uh, fierce seas. We're in turmoil. We're in rough seas right now. This is the world. Uh, the culture, uh, wokeism, um, atheism, the, you know, what is it now? The second biggest religion in the U.S. is the nuns, uh, but yeah. N-O-N-E-S, you know. Right. Um, but he saw that the, the ship went between two pillars and moored. And uh, that mooring was to give the ship the stability. And, and what was the stability? It was Mary, the first pillar. Our, Our Lady Help of Christians. And then the second pillar was the Eucharist. And um, and so as you can see, Doug, you know, God had to, you know, get some tranquility to Father Heilman up there. He had to put him between <laughs> pillars. Yeah, so and that, the, uh, the Eucharist was a little taller, and I had that too. <laughs> but I actually, I, I, I got these from my private chapel. I have these in my private chapel. So so our Lord said, you know, Father Heilman, you know, he, there's so much turmoil going on there. I got to put him, <laughs> I got to put him between the two pillars. There you go. And so, so God put him between that, the, the two pillars. <laughs> and and we got Our Lady and we got Divine Mercy. And how is Divine Mercy? Through the Eucharist. Mm. And so what a beautiful gift. And now you have a Marian on who uh, the, the Marian fathers are the community that promotes the spiritual weapons of Mar uh, Mary and Divine Mercy, which is the Eucharist. It, mm. It's an amazing connection for the show. Mm. I want to tell a little bit more about that story of the strip club going down. I was inspired and I asked 12 men to join me and we got the conference uh, table from our parish for, we have a parish with four pieces and we put it on the back of guy's truck and we went down to the former strip club and we reserved the room where the strippers danced and we took the table and up on the ceiling was the plate that held the pole. It was still there, the stripper pole. And we positioned the table underneath that spot. And I got out holy water and blessed salt. And I did the prayers of the church. And I went around and I reclaimed surrender down, ground. And we sat down for the first meeting, Knights of the Round Table, 
under the reclaimed surrendered ground for the first meeting of the Knights of Divine Mercy. And the inspiration wow. for the name came from John Paul II with his great love for the Divine Mercy devotion. Wow. And, and what does it promote? First Fridays, because we meet on First Fridays, and we are in adoration before the Holy Eucharist, and we uh, promote Marian devotion, we pray a rosary while we're there, and we offer confession during that holy hour. Then the other thing that's offered is an inspiring talk by a priest or a bishop, and uh, usually, Doug, Doug's talked there several times, hmm. and uh, and then we have a fraternal social afterwards to build that bond of unity with one another. And Father, I can tell you, we started that in 2007, that countless stories, especially young men who are who understood in that moment, they first walked into that church and saw all those other men kneeling before our Lord. They went, I'm called to be St. Joseph. I am called. And they ended up being, Father, not only lit up and all in, they became that group of guys since the been many since they're the tip of the spear in our entire diocese. They are the ones leading everything that's going on in the entire diocese. And, and all, almost all of them had abandoned their faith years prior to that. So now you know why I love John Bosco and everything, but that's what we were motivated to do that first time that strip club went down. <clears throat> and I believe, Father, and we're talking about this, how do we avoid, I love your three things. We're called, okay, to not accept godless new normals, okay? No strip clubs across the street. And you, and that's a metaphor, okay? It, it, what, what are we accepting? Remember, Sodom and Gomorrah, they weren't all Sodomites, but the rest were indifferent. They accepted it as a new normal, and God had to act. Uh, and, and so there it was comments, but whatever the chastisement is going to be, we're going to be um, judged not only for the sin itself, but for not acting to evangelize the world, to bring the light, to bring his truth. And look what's happening right now, Father. That evil is erupted so bad. Again, I, I liken it to the Turks moving in in 1571 because we're so weak. But look what they're doing to anybody who dares speak openly the truth. Right? They're just getting killed. Yeah, and and that's why God is having to uh, allow chastisements uh, for a wake-up call. Because unfortunately, yep. this might be the only way some people respond. That's right. Um, you know, uh, the prophecy, if we go back to prophecy for a moment, um, another way God has shown us how to avoid chastisement is by what he's going to allow. Now, um, I gave those signs that are scriptural that will happen before the end. But look at um, look at what happens in a lot of the prophecy. We have things like the warning, the illumination of conscience. Let me tell you, that's a great way to change before a chastisement. Why? Because you'll finally get to see yourself the way God sees you. I mean, I actually had a guy, Father, not long ago come into my confession, and he said, uh, bless me, Father, it's been 28 years since my last confession. Oh, I call those big fish. And I That's said, awesome. praise be to God. Yep, I do too. Praise be to God. Heaven is rejoicing that you are here. And then yep. he floored me with his next statement. But Father, I don't have any sins. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, let's sit down and let's go through this. Yeah, right. So when I went through the Ten Commandments and the seven deadly sins, yeah. which, by the way, the seven deadly sins, if you want a good confession, go to the seven deadly sins because we are guilty of at least one or more of those. I mean, think about them, the, yep. the seven deadly sins. And I don't mean to get sidetracked here, but I always remember them by Gilligan's Island. You've heard this oh, before? Have you heard so. this before? Okay, okay. So who was the professor? Pride. He, 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 he thought he could build a radio out of a coconut, but he could okay. never get him off the island. 
he he was always thinking he's superior to everyone else. He had pride, right? Who was sloth? You, you realize everyone 40 and under is not getting <laughs> a reference. Right. Right now. <laughs> That's right. So sloth is Gilligan. He was always looking to get out of the work. He was lazy, spiritually <laughs> lazy, physically. Okay. Who was anger? Uh, Skipper. Because Skipper was yep. always pounding on Gilligan. Yep. Right. Who was, uh, who was Marianne? Marianne was envy because she constantly wanted what Ginger had. She Ginger, didn't wasn't yeah. happy with what God gave her. Okay, <laughs> so who was Lust? Lust was Ginger. Yeah. She, she tried all, all the men on the island. She tried. Yep. She tried. Um, and then who was uh, Gluttony? Mrs. Howell. She wanted more furs, more diamonds, right. more, you know, more <laughs> everything. And then who was Greed? Mr. Howell. Because oh my gosh. he wanted more money, always about money, always about money. And I'm like, that is a great way to oh remember the seven deadly sins. Because that I tell awesome. you, if you go through a, an examination of conscience and you think about that, you're going to find something. Mm -hmm. uh, go through the Ten Commandments. You're going to find something. But uh, to answer your question, Father, I, I, I think it's important because, you know, God is allowing us gently uh, before he has to allow a chastisement. And uh, uh, the warning or the illumination of conscience, we'll get to see ourselves the way God sees us, and that is we're sinners. So anybody who says, I don't have any sin, like that guy in the confessional, you're going to be woken up. And the question is, are you going to change then? That's yeah. not a chastisement. It's God's illuminating our conscience. Right. Whether we respond or not is up to us. Yeah. Then if we don't respond, what comes next, according to the saints? The Antichrist, which he will inflict chastisements, and then the biggest of all, the three days of darkness. And people say, Father, you can't talk about the three days of darkness. Uh-uh, it is biblical. Go to Exodus 10, the ninth plague. The ninth plague in Exodus 10, very clearly, God allowed darkness over the land for three nights, three days and three nights, total darkness. That shows God has done it before. Look at the words of St. Faustina. Jesus told her, before the end, there will be a sign of the sky and all light will be darkened. Go to Acts, um, uh, uh, Acts 2.20. It talks that the sun will be darkened um, and the moon as well. So the three days of darkness is talked about by Bliz uh, Blessed Elizabeth uh, Canori Mora. It's talked about by Julie Jehenna. It's talked about by Blessed uh, Anna Marie Taigi. Um, you know, I'm not making this up. These are actual blesseds who, who are talking about this. So you are right. Um, God gives us a chance through these warnings, illuminating our conscience, um, the saints, the prophets. And if we still don't listen, he gives us something like the three days of darkness, because then if we don't change, we're, we're we you know we're out um we, we we got to wake up and the world just doesn't see it right now i mean talk about being in darkness we're in darkness right now and god is giving us the light through the scriptures the the faith the catechism and and we're not listening father i'd like your, your take your thought on something here i everything you just laid out there so clearly everything you've both been saying but in particular, we have had, as we talked about earlier in, in the episode here, um, the what looks to be a miracle that took place at the retreat you were giving in San Francisco, of all places, San Francisco, October 13, 14, I think is when it was. We had this in the pictures we, we've shown in the past, put on the screen here again now for people to see. This sort of thing happens. And then we hear about people who are seeing the miracle of the sun. Um, I've admitted on the on the episode on different episodes here that I've been blessed to see the miracle of the sun many times over the last 20 or so years and seeing it much more frequently in the last six, eight months than ever before. Um, and I'm hearing reports of other people as well. OK, those are just a couple of things, not to mention apparitions, Akita, Fatima, church approved. Do you think we have fallen into because I think we have a kind of um, news cycle the way we treat miracles, almost as if, hey, here's a new miracle, a weeping statue, it looks like in New Mexico. Oh, okay. We scroll right to the next thing. We're scrolling through life in general and looking at this, what, accumulation. How many do we need to see? How many different events have to happen? Why can't we be satisfied chewing on this wonderful miracle that God has given us, reminding us of the seriousness of our times? For example, what you just said, you just named 
um, St. Faustina to Marie Gila Jeheni to uh, several others. We have the scripture accounts. We have the saints accounts. We have miracles from people seeing the sun to weeping statues to bleeding Eucharists to what you saw with the image of Our Lady in the Eucharist in that enormous monstrance um, in San Francisco. Do you think we have fallen into kind of a trap of this uh, scrolling through news cycle mindset, even when it comes to miracles, and we can't sit down and just be satisfied with the beautiful examples that God is giving us and the warnings, which they're 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 kind of frightening, but there's a beauty to them because it's God's mercy behind them and through them. Um, does that make sense? And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the worst um, traps that we can fall into is being desensitized. Mm -hmm. um, the media has done it with uh, murders on television, violence on television, sex on television. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I don't watch network TV anymore. The only network TV I watch is football. And, uh, you know, uh, that's it. That's about the only thing. And Father, you're, you're, you're up from Packer country. I'm from Detroit. Both of our teams should have beat the 49ers. And, and uh, we, my Lions, my Lions <laughs> yeah. lost a heartbreaker. And, yeah, uh, but, uh, but I don't watch uh, network TV. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why. Um, I turned on, I was looking actually, I think for a game and I, I don't watch much TV, even game wise, but I, I was flipping and, and on one of the network stations was two men kissing mm. oh, geez. and this is network television Yeah, and yeah. I'm sure they got no letters of complaint. I'm sure they got no, no threats to take the show off the air. Why? Because we've become desensitized. Yeah, the, me the media has desensitized us. Yep. Uh, that this is all, I'll use you guys' word, the new normal. This yep. is the this is the new normal. And how yep. dangerous is that? Um, we should never become desensitized. And miracles are God's begging us. Mm -hmm. It's even allowing us to say, okay, for even those you don't believe, I'm going to show you something amazing. Then maybe you'll believe. I, okay, I'll give a quick example. I went uh, for WACOM, the World Episodic Congress of Mercy was in the Solomon Islands. And so I, I went out to the Solomon Islands and I went to Samoa. So I just beautiful people in those two places. And they had a chapel called the Chapel of the Weeping Statues. Mm. I have never seen anything like this in my life. And I took a video of it. Uh, I have a video and this is absolutely amazing. I went there, they have hundreds, not dozens, hundreds and hundreds of statues and images, icons that wept oil. And, and you can see the oil actually oozing. It's not that oil was just placed on it and it's sitting on these statues and icons. The oil was literally dropping from the eyes of Our Lady and they were catching it in these little 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 dishes, and I, I was so mesmerized. I, I, I absolutely was so enthralled with what I was seeing, and I got to admit, the people there were just walking around. They were desensitized to it. They now, granted, they're locals, and they probably had seen it, you know, uh, most days. So okay, but I, I I was like on another level. I I just was so amazed what I was looking at, that every one of these statues was weeping fresh oil and you could see it coming. It's not like, I mean, I stayed there for hours. There was no way the oil could keep continuously running um, out of the out of the eyes of Our Lady if it was put there. Uh, it, it, it's just not possible. So let us never become desensitized. Mm -hmm. And most of them, yes, some came from the palms of Jesus, from his wounds, but most of them came from the tear ducts of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. What what does that mean? Yeah. She's weeping just like she did at La Salette. Mm -hmm. I went to La Salette and there's a statue there of Our Lady with her head in her hands and she's weeping. She is literally weeping. And so this is a powerful wake up call to see Our Lady's weeping for souls that are being lost. And you know, Father, everybody tells us, speaking of the, the, men, the gladiator mentality, which, you know, we all need to be on um, is that, oh, well, why worry? God wins the war. Mm. Uh, why, Father Chris, why are you killing yourself? Why did you give up house and business and fiance and boat 
why God wins the war. God wins. Okay, yes, but we knew we were going to World War win World War II by 1943. But what was the the job of the Allies was to limit the number of casualties uh, before the war ended. So right now we know God's going to win the war. But why are we doing what we're doing? Why is Grace Force doing what it's doing? Why are the Marian Fathers doing what they're doing? To minimize casualties, mm -hmm. that is lost souls. Mm -hmm. We have to minimize the number of souls that are lost before Christ comes again. And yep. that is our mission. Yep. Yeah. I, I uh, was thinking as I was listening to you, but again, these two pillars are different sizes. And he saw that in the dream. And Our Lady took a lower pillar. And we need Our Lady close to us. She leads us to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. But here, John Bosco, I believe, is showing that Our Lady is leading us to our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. And I become convinced, and this is something we did um, back in 2020 again. We started with that procession on, on the Feast of St. John Bosco. But we ended up getting a thousand people out, and this would have been Corpus Christi, and all the clothes, all, all the sh shops were closed, and they were boarded up and filled with graffiti. And we started at uh, Holy Redeemer Church downtown, which is like a half block off of the main streets called State Street going up to the Capitol, and we rounded that corner. And all of a sudden, the few people that were out there saw this. And they started bawling. They started crying because there was some kind of hope for that. And <laughs> that date happened to be the same. Uh, it was Flag Day uh, for our country. It was, Ju it was uh, June 14th. Corpus Christi landed on Flag Day. But you know what we also discovered? It was on the anniversary when Abraham Lincoln decided uh, on J June 14, 18, whatever it was, 54, or whatever it was, um, to add the words under God hmm. to the Pledge of Allegiance. And you can see a movement in our debt time where they want to take it out again. Uh, but that's the pull, right? We are one nation under God. And, and, of course, this has nothing to do with politics. It's replete in the Bible. These oppressors, these tyrants, are trying to pull us from the arms of our Lord and say there is no God, and this is okay, and that's okay. The proverbial opening in strip clubs across the street from us. Uh, and, and so what are we going to do? We did that. And you know what happened? There was another, uh, it inspired yet another uh, Eucharistic procession, this time with the Archbishop and Bishop, Archbishop Lestecki and Bishop Hying, on the Feast of the Assumption. Okay, so two months later, and... In that, there was 3,000 people that came. And you know what happened? I think on August 16th, but it was immediately after that. All of the riots stopped. All the, the and, and people went back out in the streets and the boards were taken off the shops and peace came back to our land. And I swear it was like the day after that happened. But you, 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 it was palpable. You could see that this was happening. So I was just saying, uh, you know, when we, again, when we look at the two sides of the pillars, Our Lady is saying, yes, come to me, because I'll take you by the hand and take you to myself. But it's really about this. It's the Holy Eucharist, especially adoration. Okay, like I said, we started Night to Divine Mercy in 2007. That's an hour of adoration before our Lord. And I've always said this. You see that our Lord in the monstrance, you got to make a choice. You're not just punching the clock and getting your mass obligation in here. No, you're stopped. You're staring and you're going, okay, is that a cracker or is that God? And it changes you, okay? And I said this back then, I'm convinced that a movement of restoring adoration of the Blessed Sacrament is the spiritual therapeutic for cleansing our country of demonic influence and opening the floodgates of grace that will heal our land from Chronicles 7.13, I think. Bringing our country back to the spiritual health of being one nation under God once again. <clears throat> Amen. Father, 
Amen. We adoration and Eucharistic processions, right? But adoration, adoration, and I think adoration is going to heal the 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 way we offer the Eucharist, because you do adoration enough, you're going. We we can't have these watered down entertainment sessions. No, it needs to give God honor and glory. We need to be in awe and wonder. So uh, honestly, I think adoration is what will heal our land. Father, can you comment on that? Well, there's no question because one of the beauties of our faith, <clears throat> when we do, uh, okay, we just had the epiphany and we did the epiphany blessing here. Uh, you know, take bless chalk, you know, put it over your door. You know, the the uh, C plus M, 20 plus CM plus C plus M plus B plus 24 uh, for the three wise men and get your homes blessed. Um, the Eucharist is the best way to process through your home, get it blessed. The Eucharist, spending time before it is the best, best way to cleanse your soul. Uh, because remember, we had uh, the exorcist, Father Lampert, on our show, and he talked about, you know, a lot of people want to come in and have exorcisms to get the devil out. He said, that's the easy part. He said, that's the easy part. He said, the problem is, once the devil is evicted, he said, you remember that scripture? that the devil was removed, but he'll come back when your house is clean. He'll yep. come back with seven more seven. and your condition will be worse than, than before. So what he was saying was people will have the devil cleaned out through confession or an exorcism, but then they don't feel God in that, their, their, their soul, their empty home. And then the demons will come right back and fill it. So when people ask us, father, how do I avoid that? Adoration. Yep. Adoration, adoration. That's how you fill it. Yep. Um, you of course, empty we... religiosity. Mm. Empty because you need to fill it with actual God, the, the, the yeah. supernatural power. I always say we need a revival in the land, but I always say, wait a minute, we need natural revival in the land. Yeah. That's what and, we need. And that's the meaning of Cana. The whole meaning of Cana is yep. empty your vessel yourself. Yep. Get all the junk out, empty yep. it out so that God can fill you with the wine of the Holy Spirit. Yep. And so when How when do you he, do that? Do whatever he tells you. Exactly. Do the Very will of God. Yep. And the will of God is the two great commandments. <clears throat> love him, love your neighbor. You right. do that, you're doing the will of God. So empty yourself, pour out your junk, and then fill it with the wine of the Holy Spirit. And how do you do that? Go to confession, get to adoration, receive Holy Communion, and get to adoration. You know, it's funny because uh, how many times do we honor our, our guardian angel, either by offering our Holy Communion in gratitude for our guardian angel, or here's a great one for you that I'm sure you know, Father and, and Doug, but maybe the, the listeners don't all know. Your guardian angel was assigned to be with you at all times, no matter what. And so if you are never in the presence of God, your guardian angel, who has to stick with you, also does not really get to be in the presence of God. But if you go into adoration and you are in the presence of God, guess who's the happiest of all? Your guardian angel. You're doing a great act of charity for your guardian angel who God gave to you. And so your guardian angel wants to be in the presence of God. And when you go to adoration, your guardian angel is just in ecstasy because he gets to be in the presence of God. And you should be too. You should be the same way because you are in the presence of God. So get to adoration because it helps you and your guardian angel to be filled. That emptiness is now filled with, with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus Christ and, and the whole Trinity. It's beautiful. Father, I'd like your thoughts on this. I, when it comes to adoration in particular, um, I try to I try to encourage people. And I I do this myself. I've been doing it for quite a while now. Is when I'm out, if I don't have time or the schedule's busy or I haven't signed up for an hour of adoration that's scheduled, I will make sure I try my very best to drive near a church, get in for ten minutes, even fifteen minutes. Sometimes it's turned into thirty or forty five minutes. Like I'm going to stop in for five minutes to sit with the Lord, and I'm thirty thirty five minutes later I'm walking out. You know, churches are a lot of times empty. 
Um, and if there's no perpetual adoration set up, Jesus is still there in the tabernacle. And if that church is unlocked, we can get in there even for five or 10 minutes. And I try to do that several times a week, even. Or I think, Father Heilman, you mentioned, you know, just to encourage people to go to Mass a little earlier or stay a little later after Mass, even if it's five, 10, 15 minutes. But basically, you're, you're committing to the time, and it does build then to where an hour of adoration becomes something I think you start longing for. Your thoughts on the idea of just kind of making it a habit where if you're out and about running errands, pick the kids up from school, going to the grocery store, coming home from work, whatever it might be, make time to stop in for 5, 10, 15 minutes. What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, if we claim we have a best friend, uh, but you never, ever go to see your best friend, mm -hmm. especially when that best friend is contained like in a hospital or or mm -hmm. something, like in the hospital in the tabernacle because he's so wounded from our sins. If you had somebody that you called your best friend and you never, ever talked to them or never, ever went to see them, would they really believe you were their best friend? Mm -hmm. No, you make time, even if it's for a few minutes, to be able to go see and visit them. Um, what makes a friendship? Time together. Right. Yeah period. Yep. That's what makes a friendship. So if we are going to put God in our life as our, our go-to person, that is, that is an absolute requirement. It's not a nice thing to do. It's not simply something that, oh, it would be good if you can get to it. It's imperative mm. if you expect there to be a relationship. Mm. If you expect there's going to be a relationship, you got to do and visit that friend. And God is there for you waiting in the tabernacle. And man, every time I think about that, it, it's humbling because here he is sitting in the tabernacle all alone in these empty churches, cars driving by and people doing their own thing and nobody stopping by to make a little bit of reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus that's wounded. He's wounded in there. He's, he's in, in an infirmary in that tabernacle with his wounded sacred heart bleeding all over the place. And, and we don't have time to stop in and visit our, our, our most cherished relationship. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's not a nice thing. It's a, it's a mandatory yeah. thing. Yeah. We've been talking tonight, Father, too, about how uh, it's not just participating in the sin that's going on in the world, but it's being indifferent toward it, too. And you're careless. And I actually use care as an acronym because once a once somebody starts leaning into back into their faith, it, it, there's a sign that they care. So I use it as an acronym, and it's just simply this: the C in care is confession, or you could say come home. Mm -hmm. But you, you but come home, and and uh, we we'll get back to this blessings thing. You know, the prodigal son uh, didn't come home holding hands with the prostitute and asking father for a blessing. Okay, he came home and said, "I want to do it your way." I want to wipe the slate clean. I want to repent. I want to start fresh. Confession is amazing. That's the C. The A is adoration. Okay, that's that one-on-one -on -one where you just got beautifully done uh, saying it is, but it's that special time with the Lord where you just, it's you and the Lord and and you're just thinking, this is God. And there's ramifications to that once I say that. Once it's not just a piece of bread that we're all sharing, you know, like the Last Supper. No, that's God. Uh, if you're going to sit there and stare at the monstrance, right? Uh, and then the R is, uh, I call it Regina. you got to, what an amazing gift. We got our Blessed Mother. She or meets, Rosary. A rosary. And, and yeah. Rosary would be in there too. Mm -hmm. But but she meets us at the edge of he heaven. I think that was uh, St. Louis de Montfort, but it was one of those that's talked about she meets us at the edge of heaven we hand her her petition she goes over to the throne of god and she goes please do this for father rick okay i mean it's a beautiful image but she's our intercessor graces flow through her to us okay she's a matrix of all graces she's an amazing gift and she's the mother of god and jesus loves his mom more than anything okay so he loves those who love the, his, his mom so that c a r e is eucharist the source and summit of our faith, everything, everything stems from the Eucharist. We are a Eucharistic people. We not only get close to our Lord, but in, in Holy Communion, 
We're ingesting him. He's getting inside of us, body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's an amazing gift, and we have to treat it like it's amazing. And again, once we get to that place as Catholics, that's going to reform the Eucharist, the way that we offer it, so that we do it with awe and wonder and reverence yeah. and a sense of the transcendence. So, Father, what do you think of that? You yeah, gotta... if I if I could just mention one real more quick story at sure. this time. Um, sure. And speaking of the parts of adoration, this couple came to the shrine one day a few years ago and told me one of the most amazing stories. And the wife had a big old smile on her face, and the husband had kind of a smirk. And she went on to tell me, and she looked at her husband. She said, go ahead, tell Father Chris the story. Go ahead, tell him the story. <laughs> so uh, they went on to tell the story that uh, the husband had um, uh, a minor um, uh, a problem that he was supposed to go into for uh, uh, outpatient, a uh, little thing, a scope of his knee or something. It was something minor. And um, he went in there, she dropped him off. It was something minor. And all of a sudden they found a bad infection. Mm. And, um, and so um, she, he had to be admitted and he was admitted to the hospital. Now, prior to this, this same mom, uh, a wife had constantly begged her husband to go to adoration with her. And he says, nah, nah, nah. God knows I love him. God knows I believe in him. I don't need to do that. So Sunday after Sunday, begging him to go to mass. We, Wednesday after Wednesday, Thursday after Thursday, begging him to go to adoration. Nah, nah, nah. God knows I, I don't need to show up there. God knows I love him. So she asked him over and over and over again, she said, don't you want to go visit the Lord? No, nah, no, nah, he knows I love him. So anyway, they're back at the hospital. He calls his wife and says, I'm going to be admitted. They found a bad infection in my knee. And um, she said, oh, you know, is it life-threatening? He's like, no, but, you know, it's a bad infection. I'm going to have to spend the night. And she's, he says, so what time are you coming to see me? And she says, well, I got... I got the errands to run. I got to go get groceries. You I know gotta... I love you. <laughs> yep, exactly. And she said, you know that I got um, I, I to gotta pick the kids up, but you know I love you. And he <laughs> says, you need, you're not going to come see me? She, no, actually, he said before she said I love you. He said, aren't you going to come see me? And she said, I got all these errands for it. I got all these things to do. And he says, don't you love me? And she said, you know, I love you. I don't have to come there tonight to see you. <laughs> Did he make the connection right away? He, he, he instantly knew what she was trying to say. And they were, <laughs> they were both at the shrine and they both laughed that God had, awesome. God had taught him a lesson because yeah. he was really surprised if she loved him, that he was, she was not going to come see him. Yet the whole time he said, God knows I love him. I don't need to go to some adoration. I don't need to do that. That's God, I don't awesome. need to visit. God knows I love him. What a great story. That's awesome. Well, that Father, that, that's our time. Uh, this has been amazing. And um, the two pillars, uh, let's, let's, let's do all that we can to draw close to Our Lady. Let her take us by the hand and bring us to her son, our Eucharistic Lord. And uh, let's ask God, plead with God to heal our land. Okay, let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Thanks, Father. Thanks for being with us. Awesome. God bless you guys. <laughs>